Well, welcome to our daily psalm, which today is Psalm 8. Psalm 8. So please make sure that you've got a Bible in front of you so that you can follow the text as we go through. Psalm 8 is a glorious psalm of what I can only describe as David's bewildered adoration. You'll see that the uh, first and last verses are the same, an expression of great wonder and praise. And we'll jump straight in with verse 1, which begins by using God's personal name, Yahweh, the name that he revealed, his personal name revealed to Moses from the burning bush. So here's verse 1, Yahweh our God, how glorious, how majestic, how august is your name in all the world. But straight away comes David's bafflement number one, because this glory and majesty and wonder you would expect to be expressed with a high degree of worthiness, perhaps with sophistication by erudite philosophers, by eloquent liturgists, by professional speech writers. But no, your majesty above the heavens is praised, verse 2, out of the mouths of babes at the breast. Well, they can hardly speak. The mightiest praise comes from the weakest, the most innocent lips. And there's more for this praise that even the feeblest can employ, packs a powerful punch that silences God's enemies. Verse 2 goes on. With this or out of this praise, you have founded a stronghold against your foes, that you might still but quieten down the enemy and the avenger, put a stop to them. So, bafflement, bafflement number two, a place of strength against the enemy isn't built of towers and ramparts of stone, it's built of praise, of simply giving God his proper place in life. That's what makes a strong place. Well, the bafflement, bafflement goes on and David widens out his scope of thought. Verse 3, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have ordained, and, and we notice that threefold your, this is uh, your heavens, the work of your fingers, uh, moon and stars that you have ordained. This isn't a, a God abandoned or God empty world, but a God full world, for he made it and is in it. While I consider all of that, says David, verse 4, what is man that you should be mindful of him? The son of man that you should seek him out, him of all people. This is David's bafflement number three. God, you are so great, you made this wonderful universe, so why do you trouble yourselves with the likes of little me? Isn't it ludicrous to suggest that God of the universe should centre his interest on the tiny inhabitants of this tiny planet? And in verse 5, David goes on in similar bewildered vein. God, you've given us this position of astonishing privilege. Why? For you've made him little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honour. The psalmist is uh, referring there to uh, human beings as the climax of God's creative genius in Genesis chapter 1. And then in the following verses, in verses uh, 6 to 8, um, he references the responsibility that God places on human beings to care for God's uh, creation, his beloved, beloved planet, that duty of stewardship of the earth in God's name, which God gives to Adam in Genesis chapter 2, verse 6. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You entrust him with something so precious. You've put all things under his feet. You've elevated him above it all. And not just some, but all sheep and oxen, even the wild beasts of the field, for goodness sake. The birds of the air, the fish of the sea, things that move around in spheres that we cannot go into ourselves. You've made us 
stewards of that too. You've put us over them and whatsoever moves in the paths of the sea. These verses form one amazed statement after another. God, you've, you've put us above all this, in charge of all this. You've made us royalty. Why would you do that? Well, David doesn't give an answer to his question, though we might think on to Psalm 23, which would go a long way to express one with its delight in the company of the flock that they enjoy with their shepherd. But it is actually when we look further than that and go into the New Testament that we find a true answer to David's question, the answer in Christ. Paul describes Jesus as the firstborn over all creation in Colossians 1.15 and in 1 Corinthians 15.23 as the first fruits of the new life that's instigated through his death and resurrection. So Jesus is the new Adam, great David's greater son, and the pattern for those who would choose, like David, to make the praise of Yahweh our world. So Jesus is the Son of Man, in capital letters now, to which verse 4 in Psalm 8 points. Jesus is the one crowned with glory and honour. Jesus is the one given dominion over everything that God has made. David's psalm and the question he raises find their fulfilment, find their answer, find their inspiration in Christ. The love and grace of God in Jesus is why God is mindful of little human beings. It is why he seeks out their company and delights in it. Which makes the final verse of Psalm 8 such an appropriate summary of all that David has been expressing or trying to express, his bafflement, and our response to the God who entrusts us with so much and loves to see us fulfill his desires for us. Yahweh our God, how glorious is your name in all the world and it includes my world and my heart. Let's take a moment to pray. We bless you, maker and master of the heavens, with David, we are astonished and humbled by your grace to make us stewards of your beautiful world. And we bow the knee to your Son, who is our pattern and our life. And we ask for more, for greater capacity to praise you and to serve you in the new creation of his resurrection life. For your glory's sake. Amen.